Good afternoon. My name is Young Jun Son. I'm school head of industrial engineering. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Johnson. Uh, as many of you uh, may know, uh, I joined the Purdue last June. And uh, David was our, at that time, assistant professor. The first uh, uh, professor, assistant professor, uh, whom I worked to uh, 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 to help and then work to uh, for his uh, promotion here. Uh, by the way, I joined from University of Arizona, uh, which is a number two basketball team today, <laughs> to number one basketball team Purdue here. Okay, so I needed to mention that. Okay, so uh, David, uh, he's uh, our uh, associate professor in industrial engineering and uh, political science. And he also has a, uh, a courtesy appointment in civil engineering. And uh, uh, of course, when I joined the uh, Purdue, um, I needed to uh, meet with the, uh, every you know, single professor to learn you know, what they are doing. And uh, I was uh, truly amazed, right, the, uh, the impactful work that the, uh, David is doing. So if you visit uh, uh, State of uh, Louisiana website today, you will see the risk assess model of the, I mean, Louisiana, you know, that has a, a lot of the flood and so on, and that this uh, preparation of the, uh, those, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the flood uh, for next, uh, you know, the 20, 30 years is very important. And uh, the, there is a risk model that was uh, led, okay, by Davis' team, and which uh, impacts over 50 billion, not million, $50 billion next to the uh, 30 years. And that's the kind of the impactful work that David is doing. And David uh, received a lot of the awards, including NSF Career Award, and also he's an outstanding teacher. He received uh, two outstanding uh, teaching awards from the College of Engineering. So let's listen to more about uh, David. OK, let's welcome David. <laughs> All right, thank you, Son. I appreciate the introduction. Um, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I took kind of a non-traditional path to get here, and so I thought I would just kind of talk about how I ended up here in this room today, rather than really talking as, as much on my research. Um, but before I jump into it, I do want to acknowledge um, my wife, who's here, um, my cats, who are not here. but. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be here without them, certainly, and the sacrifices that they have made. Um, our cat, Meerkat, who passed away in January, but uh, we had her for 18 years. So she has been along the entire journey as well. And then the two rascals on the right uh, are recent acquisitions in the last few months. Um, and truth be told, only one of them is a rascal. Um, the other one is a total sweetheart. But the uh, the one on top of the couch is the reason I have some scratches on my arms at the moment. Um, so they've been uh, tremendously helpful in, in getting me here today. So I wanted to acknowledge them as well as my students, who I believe I got a, found a picture of every, of every one of them except for one, um, who was an undergrad that worked with me as well. But have had uh, a lot of students over the years, some of whom are, are here today as well. Um, I hinted that there would be food and an opportunity to hear me tell stories that I've told them before. But um, they are just fantastic and, and a joy to work with. And I think one of the real reasons why I'm here in academia as opposed to doing what I had been doing before in academia. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and kind of my, my path. But also want to acknowledge that I have a lot of colleagues that I collaborate with a lot of mentors. These are mostly on the, the mentors list of people that I can talk to and feel like I learn something new every time that I talk to them. Um, just here at Purdue, in a whole wealth of different departments. Um, I should note, you know, some of the students that I've worked with in the past have come, uh, supervised an ag econ student, supervised a, a civil engineering student on the right, so it's not all just within industrial engineering and political science. And so the connections that I've made have been just extremely valuable. Um, and I'm very thankful for all of the folks here and probably the folks that I've forgotten, unfortunately. 
um, that I've been really, really fortunate. Um, and have also had a lot of mentors elsewhere, including Sandy Power at NC State, um, who first sold me on math um, and got me to you know, think about grad school and so on, and um, others that I, I still collaborate with today. So in terms of my background, um, I started out, you know, graduated high school in 1999. My mom was a high school math teacher um, at this school and then another. And so she had a lot of old math competition questions just sitting around. And so when I was in school, in, in high school, I would sit in the back of the class, regardless of which class it was, and just do math problems um, for fun. She kind of really inspired the love of math for me. And these competition problems are you know, problems that have oftentimes sort of a, a brute force solution. And then there's also a trick. There's some sort of a, a beautiful, elegant solution to them. If you can see it, that gives you a great shortcut. Um, and I think that's really what got me hooked on doing math, was being able to see those types of like, really elegant, beautiful solutions to things that are unexpected. Um, and that is kind of carried on to what I try and pursue in my own research, where now there's not a clever, elegant solution to every problem that I work on, um, but I still enjoy looking for that um, and trying to find the beauty in the work that I'm doing. So I ended up going to NC State and got a bachelor's in math um, and met my wife there. We started dating the first weekend of freshman year. Uh, and now I've been together coming up on our 20th anniversary in January. So <clears throat> graduated from NC State after doing math there. Thought that I would get a PhD in math, but I had no idea what subfield within math I was interested in. I did some research um, in both math and astrophysics and a tribology physics lab as well and kind of learned that I wasn't going to be an experimentalist. I was more just a... a math major who also liked physics um, and really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do next. And so I took a year, uh, worked as a software developer while trying to think about that and then ended up deciding to go to Cambridge to do a master's in math so that I could have a lot more courses and see what grabbed me and figure out, okay, what do I want to do the PhD in math? In. By the time I graduated at Cambridge, I thought I was going to take some time and then do a PhD in Chinese studies instead, um, which was unexpected. Ultimately, I decided against that um, and, again, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do next. Uh, we moved back to the U.S. right around the time of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Didn't have plans, and so we ended up moving down to Houston. Um, to help with some of the relief efforts there. Um, my wife ended up doing an AmeriCorps VISTA stint for two years. And I ended up working at McKinsey & Company, where I was doing private management consulting and had a kind of kindred spirit there that I was working on an engagement in New Hampshire in the dead of winter um, for four months. And I think we were both a little bit disgruntled with the work I enjoyed kind of the creative problem solving of management consulting, but just wasn't working on the types of problems that I was most interested in. I was very interested in trying to kind of use the math skills that I had to have some sort of a real world impact and was more interested in kind of public sector, social impact than private sector, corporate impacts. So I ended up quitting my job at McKinsey to start a music company a music website that <clears throat> I worked on for a number of years until eventually working on a PhD became too time consuming to keep up with the website. Um, and so that was when I ended up at RAND. Uh, my colleague at McKinsey was a graduate of the policy program at the RAND Graduate School. He knew that I was interested in a wide range of different things and that I was more wanting to do public sector work and so he told me about policy analysis. And I thought, isn't that just politics? And he's like, no, no. Policy and politics are totally different. 
you would be great with policy analysis. You'll love it. And so as I was evaluating grad schools, again, thinking about what I would eventually do a PhD in, I applied to eight or nine different schools in five different fields. Um, <laughs> because again, I'm just easily distracted by like intellectual shiny objects or easily convinced that things are interesting. And when I went to visit Rand, uh, it just felt like home, that this was going to be a place where I could work on a PhD, but also be making a real difference in the world at the same time, instead of disappearing for five years and coming back with a dissertation that someone outside of your committee might read eventually, but um, you never quite know. One of the degree requirements at RAND for the policy program there is that you have to have 300 days of billable time working like any other researcher at RAND. And so that introduced me to a lot of the different research areas that I'm still working in today. Um, I ended up staying at RAND. They kind of made an exception. Just like academia, they don't typically hire their own, but um, I ended up staying at RAND working as a mathematician for a couple of years and then was invited to apply for a position at Purdue for the Building Sustainable Communities Cluster Hire. And this was a group of faculty lines across three different colleges that are people who look at um, community resilience and sustainability issues from a very multidisciplinary perspective. And when I had been on the job market after finishing my PhD, one of the reasons I didn't jump into academia at the time was because I didn't find any postings that were quite broad enough to encompass all of the things that I wanted to be working on. And this cluster hire finally did have all of those kind of qualities to it. And so I thought, if I'm going to jump into academia, then this is the time to do it. This is going to be the perfect posting. I'm not going to find something um, as unique as that cluster hire. Um, and I'm just so glad that I ended up doing it. I've really been enjoying my time here. It's been great. So I can talk a little bit about some of the work that I got turned on to at RAND that I'm still working on today, including what Sun mentioned. Um, I do flood risk modeling for the Louisiana state government. I've gotten involved in some projects in Texas as well and collaborations with um, people elsewhere across the country. I developed a greenhouse gas emissions model for biofuels feedstocks for DOE. And that has led into a lot of work here collaborating with people in ag econ at Purdue as well as hydrologists and crop scientists at other institutions looking at sustainable agriculture and looking at also kind of biofuels and renewable energy systems. And then did some work with the El Dorado Irrigation District in Northern California, working on water scarcity management under climate change. And when I was trying to think about my tenure package and kind of what my trajectory would be like in academia, I was thinking like, am I going to have to give some of these up to really focus? Or can I still have a really broad portfolio if I can think of um, kind of an underlying theme behind all of it and un an understanding of why I'm interested in working in all of these different things, given that they take totally different methods, different skill sets, um, you know, different topical knowledge. And really, I sort of realize that what really interests me is just kind of long range planning for risk management in the environmental policy space and thinking about better ways that we can both assess risk as well as make better decisions about how to manage it. And, and so that's kind of the banner that I work under. And, and look at how do we cope with uncertainty about future conditions, trade-offs between different objectives, and then most recently I've gotten really interested in equity implications of the work that I'm doing, you know, how to incorporate equity into the evaluation of projects for risk mitigation, um, and the state in Louisiana incorporated some of that work into their latest coastal master plan. And so I'm really excited and fortunate to be working with policymakers and officials that really value some of the same things that I do and are interested in pushing the boundaries of science directly into policy. Um, and so I was just tremendously in the right place at the right time to kind of get started on this trajectory. And so what I've kind of taken away from it 
um, that I would share is that for people kind of seeking tenure, especially if you have really broad interests like mine, then you know, don't compromise on a good fit. Don't just take a position because they want to hire you. Um, if it's not going to be a good fit, then you're not going to be happy with the position. You're not going to be as successful as you might be if you feel like you have to put yourself in a box that you don't want to be in. So don't compromise on that. That was one thing that I was just thrilled when I was interviewing here. Um, you know, I asked, hey, is it going to be a problem if I spend a lot of time writing publications that are, end up in the gray literature? You know, if I'm publishing something in a 300-page technical appendix to a state government report, rather than journalifying everything, is that okay? Um, and they said, well, that's great concrete evidence, you know, of the impact of your work. That if a state government is publishing it themselves, that's clear evidence that they value it um, and are using it. And so that was what assured me that it was going to be a good fit. Um, I would also say don't be discouraged by failures. I ended up being either PI or co-PI on, I think, six NSF proposals before getting one. Um, and then I was co-PI on that one, wrote a few more that got rejected. And then in the year before going up for tenure, I got a lead PI on an NSF grant looking at seismic risk in Los Angeles. Um, again, a new topic for me, but infrastructure risk under natural hazards. So similar kind of under, undercurrent. A DOD grant looking at incorporating downscale climate projections into decision making for defense installations. A National Academies Gulf Research Program project on incorporating equity into decision making for flood risk management. And then an NSF career award. And so kind of the floodgates eventually opened for all of these things that I'm, I'm leading. Um, and so eventually you'll get there and don't be discouraged and, and take risks, you know, kind of along those same lines. Don't be afraid to try on new ideas even when you're under the, the pressure and tenure clock. And think about, you know, what is the societal impact that you want your work to have um, as much as your own scholarly identity. So with that, um, I'll pause for questions. So thank you so much for, for being here. Questions? Yes. We're very fortunate to have you and now get a chance to keep you here. <laughs> you. The question is, uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, who actually found you and invited you for, to apply for the job? <laughs> Uh, one of my colleagues in the industrial engineering department um, who went to NC State with us when I was an undergrad um, knew what I had been up to at RAND um, and found out about this cluster and said, oh, you should really contact this guy, David. He's a friend of mine. Um, I think he would be a perfect fit. So uh, that was a, another coincidence of being in the right place at the right time to kind of find out about the position. Yeah. Anyone else? David, great talk. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, someone trying to enter policy, like f from a completely different perspective? And I think that probably happened to you when you went to RAND, maybe. I don't know what, what stage. But how do you uh, approach these stakeholders? How do you think about um, making changes? Like, what are some things that people may not think about, right? Like, for example, you mentioned the policy analysis versus politics, right? Mm -hmm. that there's a big difference, sure. which people may not know about. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in terms of just getting started, um, like I said, I was kind of in the right place at the right time, but have been continuing to try and build other connections as well over the years. So I think what I would recommend is that first, you need to just go talk to stakeholders or officials that work in an area that you're interested in and you think that you might have something that you can contribute, but don't go in with a sales pitch. You know, it's more of an informational interview, trying to connect and trying to understand what are their pain points, you know, and what are problems that they have that they could do better on if they had 
certain data that doesn't exist, or if they could analyze something that they just don't know how to at this stage. And just trying to understand kind of where they feel like there could be improvement in their own work. Um, and then if you feel like, okay, yeah, I can contribute to that, then look at writing proposals with them and having them on board. Um, look at trying to get some preliminary results or something that you could show them that is suggestive that you know, maybe there's something that we can work on together. But you always have to keep in mind that um, working on a government client timeline and budget is different than an academic timeline and budget. Um, and those don't always align very well. So it's a little bit tricky, but you just have to be really persistent about it. Um, be happy to talk about it more without experience. But. Any last question? If not, I need to mention that the, uh, in addition to huge society, society uh, impact that you saw, so we have a monthly meeting with the, our undergraduate students that happens to be yesterday. And you know the engineers design make things and industrial engineers design and make things better. And uh, any type of the systems and so we ask students that what are the kind of the problems, okay, that uh, you didn't know that you learned and we were talking about you, David. Yeah. The kind of impact that you are making to society as well as our student is huge and looking forward to seeing your continued success next few years, okay? So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.